Welcome to Oak Grove Baptist Church, Kings Mountain, North Carolina worship service, April the 19th, 2020. We are so glad that you are here with us. However you're viewing this, wherever you're viewing it, we just pray that God has shown himself in a mighty way and that you're ready to worship him as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Before we get ready to go into our time of worship, will you pray with me? Father, we thank you so much for another day. We thank you for allowing us to meet together as the body of Christ. Lord, we still miss the smiling faces and the idea of being in a fellowship in a, in a building where we can all come together corporately as the body of Christ. But we are reminded that where two or more are gathered, you're promised to be present. And Lord, we want to just make this time a time where we put our distractions to the side, where we ask the Holy Spirit to breathe on us and guide us through a time of corporate worship and to hear a word from you. Thank you for meeting us where we're at. Change us, receive all the glory. It's in your name we pray. Amen. You give life, you are love, you bring light to the darkness, you give hope, you restore. Every heart that is broken, great are you, Lord. It's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise. We pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise to you only. You give life, you are love, you bring light to the darkness, you give hope, you restore. Every heart that is broken, and great are you, Lord. It's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise, we pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise to you only. And all the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry. These bones will sing. Great are you. shout your praise our hearts will cry these bones will sing great are you lord it's your breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise we pour out our praise it's your breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise, we pour out our praise, it's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise, we pour out our praise, it's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise to you only. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus, just to take him at his word, just to rest upon his promise, just to know the saith the Lord. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I him or and or Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh for grace to trust him more. Oh how 
how sweet to trust in Jesus Just to trust His cleansing blood Just in simple faith to plunge me Neath the healing cleansing flood Jesus, Jesus, how I trust Him How I prove Him over and o'er Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus Oh, for grace to trust Him more Jesus, Jesus, how I trust Him How I proved Him over and o'er Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus Oh, for grace to trust Him
hurting and broken within Overwhelmed by the weight of your sin Jesus is calling Have you come to the end of yourself? Do you thirst for a drink from the well? Jesus is calling Oh, come to the altar, the Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Leave behind your regrets and mistakes Come today, there's no reason to wait Jesus is calling Bring your sorrows and trade them for joy From the ashes a new life is born Jesus is calling Oh, come to the altar, the Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, what a The Father's arms are open wide Forgiveness was bought with The precious blood of Jesus Christ Oh, come to the altar The Father's arms are open wide Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Good morning, everyone. This morning we're going to be learning about the power of the Holy Spirit. Before Jesus left earth for heaven, he promised to send the Holy Spirit. Listen to what happened when the Holy Spirit came. I'm going to be reading from Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. When the day of the Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a noise came from heaven. It sounded like a strong wind blowing. This noise filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw something that looked like flames of fire. The flames were separated and stood over each person there. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they began to speak different languages. The Holy Spirit was giving them the power to speak these languages. The Holy Spirit filled the believers and empowered them to speak in other languages so the gospel of Jesus could spread. So let me explain how the Holy Spirit helps us. If this egg is fresh, it will sink in plain water. Watch the egg sink. But what do you think will happen when I put it in this second glass of water? It's floating. Would you like to know how I did that? In this experiment, the first and second glasses look pretty much identical, but there is an important difference. I added salt to the water in the second glass. 
and salt makes the water dense to the, so that the egg floats. This experiment helps us imagine what it was like for the disciples before and after the Holy Spirit came to them. At first, they had no power to do what Jesus commanded them. But after the Spirit came, the disciples probably looked about the same, but they had the power they did not have before, the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit helps Christians follow Jesus. So take a few moments and discuss these next couple of questions. What happened when the Holy Spirit came to the disciples? And what does the Holy Spirit do? I challenge you to practice depending on the Holy Spirit's power to help us follow Jesus. You can pray and ask for help in following Jesus. Let's pray together now. God, I thank you for this day and I thank you for these words that you've given us. Um, I thank you for um, your word and I thank you for the Holy Spirit that you've placed upon us when we become Christians so that way we can learn to be more like you and we can depend on you in no matter what situation we're in. And I just pray that we'll be able to um, learn to depend on you and keep you as a priority in our life. In your name we pray. Amen. Just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou bidst me come to thee, O Lamb of God, I come, I come. Just as I am and waiting not to rid my soul of one dark blood to Thee whose blood can cleanse each spot, O Lamb of God, I come, I come. Just as I am, poor wretched, blind, sight rich as healing of the mind. Yes, all I need in Thee I find, O Lamb of God, I come, I come. Just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou bidst me come to thee, O Lamb of God, I come, I come. Again, thanks to our worship team, our staff, all our lay leaders for allowing this service, contributing to this service happening each and every week. A lot of different hands, a lot of different talents being utilized uh, to make this kind of happen. So again, we thank the Lord for uh, all that he's doing here at our fellowship. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord Jesus, as we have attempted to worship you through song, Father, we just want to take a moment and to pray and to lift up your name that is above all names and ask that you would calm our hearts and as you meet us where we're at today, whether we're just so excited to be lifting your name again or if we're kind of downtrodden and got things heavy on our hearts, thank you for meeting us where we're at. And as we get ready to dive in your word, Lord, I just pray that just as we've had a chance to worship you through song, that we'll worship you through the reading of your word. Thank you so much for allowing us to corporately come together as the body of Christ, even in this situation, even through technology. 
And we just want to give you all the praise and glory. It's in your name we pray. Amen. All right, I've entitled my message this morning, A Walk to Remember. So if you got your Bibles, you remember where that's at. Go and get your Bibles and turn to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 24, verse 13. Again, Luke 24, verse 13. A walk to remember. Starting with verse 13, here's God's Word. Now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. Again, now the same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. Father, not my will but yours, not my words but yours. We do ask the Holy Spirit to breathe on us. And again, allow us to understand what you want to speak to us about today. We lay everything at your feet, all of our expectations, all of our adoration. And just ask that as you communicate with us, Father, that we understand and apply all that you teach us. Receive the glory. In your name we pray. Amen. How do you communicate information with others? How do you communicate and receive information with others? Everybody, I guess you say, in this age that we're living in might communicate or receive information through texts, phone, internet, this service itself. But have you ever thought about where do you express and collect your information? Where do you collect it? Where do you express it? Is it while standing? Is it while sitting? Is it running? Is it during prayer time? Is it during work time? Is it while you're laying down? There's all different ways that you and I can receive information. It's interesting to think about the stance with which we receive that information. Depending on your current health situation, or maybe the requirements of your job, or uh, the preference you have when you're having some downtime, all of us connect and accept information in different ways. The Bible has several examples of how God can use man's different stances to communicate with his creation and glorify his name. Whether you are standing, Psalm 40 and Proverbs 10, whether you are sitting, Psalm 1, Psalm 139, whether you're running, Hebrews chapter 12 and 1 Corinthians chapter 9, or walking, Genesis chapter 3, chapter 5 and 6, and Ephesians 5, God can meet us how we are and where we are. Some of the most effective prayer times I've ever had is during times where I used to run. Uh, up until about a year ago, I had gotten this... Uh, I guess you say hook on running and I would run four or five times a week and I would run an hour to two hours at a time and and that endorphin kick was so good and and I was I felt like I was getting healthy ironic that my back blew out because I ran too much but that being said it was an opportunity for me to hear from God I used that time as my prayer time you see, I was still before the Lord, Psalm 46, verse 10, and I listened to God and I laid everything before his feet, Psalm 55, verse 22. Whether it was my family members, whether it was my co-workers, whether it was my mental state, my emotional state, my physical, intellectual, financial, and spiritual needs, all of it I laid before the Lord as I ran that race, which was, again, something internally I did during that time. Everything was placed, though, at God's feet as I ran. My time of worship increased. My vision to see what he would have me see increased. But then when my back did blow out and I had to find another way to have that quiet, quiet time, God had to reinvent inside of me how I was going to hear from him. A different stance to hear that message. Well, that's where walking has come in. It's been an awkward transition. I'm still a work in progress there, but I will say, you know, besides the pace being frustrating, because I want to go quicker, I feel like I can go do what I did before. The pace might be different, but man, the still opportunity to be alone with God and to actually hear from Him as I walk and to pray 
and to listen and to talk with him is still as good as it was when I was running. When we walk with God and allow him to dictate our pace, light our way, and show us his will, even more details can present themselves. When you're running, sometimes you can get ahead of God. And I remember sometimes I would run and I would forget that, hey, wait a minute, I'm actually supposed to be talking to God here, lis listening to him, laying everything before him. And sometimes I get so caught up with being that physical fit moment that um, I might miss out on what he might hear, might be saying to me. I might miss out on what I should be hearing. God forced me to pump the brakes and settle into his path so that I might be able to see and hear what I'm supposed to see and hear and do what he has asked me to do. Well, this morning, we're going to look at another particular walk found in the scriptures, found in Luke chapter 24. Jesus joined a couple of his disciples, and they were uh, on their way to a certain path. And this morning, we're going to kind of uncover some specifics about that walk and consider what made it so memorable while attempting to strengthen our own pay, pace as we follow Christ. If you've got your Bibles again and you want to look through uh, the, the book of Luke, um, it's interesting to point out some background things. I'm not going to stand and say on that too much, but I will point out a couple things. The author, Luke, he was uh, considered um, to be a Gentile. Uh, he was a companion of the Apostle Paul, uh, the person that, that was given credit again for this particular book, written around 60 to 80 A.D., um, he wrote all of these accounts with some historical and orderly fashion, when you think about it, um, the way he's got it so structured in the scripture. Um, he addresses the Greeks, specifically Theophilus, and uh, we've talked about Theophilus before in the past. He was a Roman soldier, either as a recent convert to Christianity um, or a, a hopeful convert to Christianity. But again, the Gospel of Luke is a thinking man's gospel. There's a lot of meat and potatoes in there. And uh, we're going to kind of see the importance of this particular passage in a moment. So now we're going to get to the backdrop. What's going on leading up to this particular passage? Um, remember, just as we talked about it with the Easter, um, things that occurred leading up to the crucifixion of Jesus. Um, Jesus was betrayed. We know that was Judas Iscariot. And we talked about that in Luke chapter 22, verses 1 through 6. We think about the Passover meal. That, um, that, that the disciples partook of, and also the Last Supper, which was the Lord's Supper that we know with the disciples. Again, Luke 22, verses 7 through 38. We know that Jesus prays, uh, Luke 22, verses 39 through 46. We know that he was arrested. We know that he was denied, and specifically, not only all his disciples left, but he was denied by Peter. Luke chapter 22, verses 54 through 62. He's mocked, he's beaten, he's put on trial, verses 63 through 71. All the religious leaders uh, they, um, they, that, that did not believe that he was the Messiah, they, they wanted him dead and, and, and they punished him. And, and, and under Roman law, uh, verses 16 through 25 of Luke chapter 23, uh, Jesus is indeed crucified. He committed no crime, no sin was committed, and yet he died. He was crucified. But Jesus still saves, verse 26 through 43. The centurion, we didn't talk about him last time, but he bears witness in Luke 23, verses 44 through 49, and also Mark 15 through 39. He bears witness that surely this man was the Son of God. For Jesus' followers, the, the time was a dark time. They believed that Christ, the Messiah, the Chosen One, the Son of God, that was, was supposed to deliver Israel out of bondage, well, everything that the prophets and everything that they hoped for was not coming to pass. Now, Jesus was put to rest in this tomb, Luke 23 through 53. And so went the vision and the hope that they had. Not so. As we know and as we celebrated this past Easter, all that took place, everything that Jesus promised, the Son of Man that would rebuild the temple, his temple, John 2, verses 19 through 21, would raise from the grave. 
and all that would occur, and, and, and he would defeat death's sting, 1 Corinthians 15, 55, and, and everybody that would go and see what was occurring, the women that would go and, and, and see where the tomb was and where he was supposed to be laying, and, and that, that stone was rolled away, and Jesus was not inside. He was risen, and the disciples, they, they didn't believe that everything they, they went back and told them about. Could it be, they thought, was he risen? They didn't know, and that brings us really to what we're going to talk about today in Luke chapter 24, verses 13 through 36. Now, what's happening as we lead up to this passage, and I'm going to encourage you to go ahead and get your Bibles now, because we're going to look, read all verses 13 through 36 found in Luke chapter 24. But as we're seeing that there's going to be this, this excursion, um, this memorable uh, walk that is occurring with two of Jesus' disciples. And we're going to see how it all plays out as we read God's Word. Again, look with me at Luke chapter 24, verses 13 through 36. Now the same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that happened, verse 15. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him, verse 17. He asked them, what are you doing discussing, excuse me, what are you doing discussing together on this walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast, and one of them, named Clovis, asked him, Are you only a visitor to Jerusalem and do not know the things that have happened there in these days? What things, he asked, verse 19, about Jesus of Nazareth, he replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and all rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what more, it is the third day since all this took place, verse 22. In addition, some of the women amazed us. They went to the tomb early in the morning, but didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the woman had said, but him they did not see. Verse 25. He said to them, how foolish you are and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets had spoken. Did not the Christ have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? Verse 27. And the beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. As they approached the village to which they were going, verse 28, Jesus acted as if he were going further. But they urged him strongly, Stay with us, for it is nearly evening. The day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. Verse 30. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks. Before it, he broke it and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him. And, they did, and then he disappeared from their sight. Verse 32. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us? while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? They got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. There they found the eleven and those with them assembled together and saying, It's true! The Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. Then the two told what they had happened on the way and how Jesus recognized them when he broke the bread. Verse 36, while they were still talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Powerful scripture. Um, you can't read it enough times to, to appreciate everything that was occurring from the road to Emmaus to into the very presence of the disciples 
who see Jesus together collectively for the first time since the crucifixion. Let's look at verses uh, 13 through 17, kind of like a scripture breakdown, a uh, recap of what we just read in the passage. All right, these two disciples, one of them name is Cleopas, C-L-E-O-P-A-S, um, say that three times, um, not one, they weren't the original 11. They were talked, they were walking uh, and talking and, and going down this road to Emmaus. It's an unknown location. Uh, it's believed to be about a town, maybe uh, Kubith. That is, I was doing some research on that and looking at some commentaries. K-U-B-E-I-B-E-H. Check that out. About seven miles northwest of Jerusalem. And they, they meet this stranger. And that stranger, ironically, is Jesus. And he joins them for the journey and asks them, you know, what they're talking about. All right? What they're talking about. He acted as if he didn't know what occurred all weekend. And if anybody knew what happened that weekend, Jesus certainly did. Those two disciples, they were, they were restrained from recognizing who Jesus was. And, and so it was kind of kept from them as they're hearing and interacting with him. And verses 18 through 21, uh, the disciples, they, 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 they talk about the crucifixion. And they can't believe that he didn't know about this well-known event. And so they begin to describe to him everything about Jesus. All their hopes, all their, their adoration of, of him being the prophet, the Messiah, the one that, that, uh, that would deliver them. And how, indeed, the, the rumors were out there that a resurrection had occurred. And yet, they didn't stick around in Jerusalem to find out about those rumors. They were heading to the town of Emmaus. Have you ever been disappointed before? They were so disappointed. I know some folks are disappointed with everything that's going on with the coronavirus. Schools are being canceled. Graduations are being canceled. Um, lives are being altered. Lives are being lost. Um, they, and I think, you know, it's hard to believe all those things are occurring, but they are. I, I look back and I think back about 9-11. Um, when that all occurred, I couldn't believe what I was watching on TV. I couldn't believe as I was watching the, the Twin Towers were being hit and, and, and everything that I uh, was thinking I was going to do that day all was put on pause. And there are some things that you know we can't believe are happening and, and there are good things that we can't believe are happening. I've never won the lottery. I've never played the lottery. Well, I did get that as a Christmas gift from one of my cousins once, but that's beside the point. They were so wanting to win the lottery. And if I would have won the lottery, I'd have told them, no way. Shut your mouth. There's no way that happened. I never would have been one that would ever believe I would win something like that. So sometimes we don't want to believe because it's so bad. And sometimes we don't want to believe because it, it's beyond our thinking. It's beyond our reasoning. So these disciples, even though they heard that the resurrection might have happened, that these eyewitnesses, these women that had gone and said the tomb, right, was, was empty. And Mary Magdalene, you know, being and sharing, hey, it wasn't the gardener. Jesus is alive. They're still on this road to Emmaus. I, they just didn't want to believe that their expectation of who Jesus was going to be and who he was, they didn't connect. And so their communication was disconnected. And so we're going to see how Jesus connects that on this, this, this memorable walk that they have. Verse 22 through 26, again, reminds us of, of what uh, the women said at the tomb. And, and then, well, Jesus dives in verse 27 through 32, and he begins to talk to the disciples. They had shared, shared this story, right? And now Jesus has a story to share with them. He takes the disciples on their journey and he walks with them and, and, and he begins to discuss with them all the things that occur, right? And again, the disciples, they don't recognize him. And, 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 and he begins to talk to them about the times of old. It talks about the times of, the, of Moses and the prophets. He explains the scriptures as it relates to himself. And as, as he shares this story, I mean, I, I can only imagine as they're having these discussions, you know, what, what these, these guys must have been thinking. Man, this guy is an awesome biblical scholar. This guy has a lot of great knowledge for somebody not going what's going on in Jerusalem. Man, unbelievable how much he knows. And then as they're about to stop at their stopping point, Cleopas and the other disciples say, well, hey, wait a minute. 
Because the stranger, Jesus, was acting like he's going to keep going. And instead of keep going, they said, hey, would you stay? It's going to be evening soon. Let's break bread together. Let's sup together. Um, you know, and so he agrees. And, and as they're sitting down for their meal, and as he takes the bread and he gives thanks and he gives it to them, the disciples' eyes were open. I just got chills. Did you? The disciples' eyes were open. And now all of a sudden, they see and recognize this is Jesus. You ever had something like that happen before? You weren't expecting uh, one result and then the other result occurred? I remember uh, my wife had a 40th birthday. Yes, that's hard to believe that she actually is 40. But we had a surprise birthday party for her. We dropped her by uh, one of my, um, well, it's actually my in-law's church. We were going to go by and see uh, our father, my father-in-law and my mother-in-law for something or pick something up. And in the room, unbeknownst to her, there was 40 people that were just waiting to go surprise. And so when we bring around the corner, we hit the lights and we go surprise, she about came out of her skin. I can only imagine that was amazing and fun for me. But think about the Son of God. Think about Jesus, who the last time they saw was crucified on the cross. Yes, they heard the rumors that he might be alive, but they didn't see him. They didn't know. And then as their eyes, those scales were pulled away, as that veil was pushed back, as whatever that was keeping them from seeing who Jesus was on that walk to remember, now that's all pushed away, and Jesus presents himself to those disciples. And just like that, just as he was presenting himself to those disciples, guess what? He vanishes. No, he's no David Copperfield. It was no magician. It was no fake, mystic, some medium, some ghost out there. No, it was God. It was Jesus in the flesh there. And just as he was with them on the walk, now he's gone. Now, what did those disciples do? Well, they moved. They moved quickly. We read in verses 33 through 36, uh, the two disciples, they head back to Jerusalem. And I imagine their walk going away from Jerusalem was quite different than their walk back to Jerusalem. I bet you they weren't walking too slow. I bet you they were speed walking. They were moving them hips like nobody's business. I bet you the conversation was fast and furious. I bet you they started running. I don't care if their back was messed up or not. They started moving and shaking, and they got back to report to, indeed, the rest of the disciples, the original 11, that Jesus was alive. And just as they're sharing that information, guess who appears? Peace be with you, he says. Jesus was there in the flesh. Confirming those rumors that indeed he was alive. It's amazing to think about all that occurred on that walk away from Jerusalem on Emmaus and the walk back. The excitement that must have been in those disciples' hearts, knowing that the Jesus they last saw had died, but now the Jesus they saw on their road, on that walk to remember, was alive. I can only imagine. I can only imagine what it had to feel like to report that eyewitness account of him being alive and then hearing him say, to the disciples and them in that room. Peace be with you. I would have needed some peace. I would have been freaked out. That would have tore me up like nobody's business. But as their heart burned, as their soul churned, my question for you is this. So what? Why does their experience matter to me? As we continue to further contemplate these additional events surrounding the resurrection of Jesus and this walk to remember on the road to Emmaus, what point stands out to me more than others? Why should the walk to Emmaus matter to me? Got one point to share with you, and then we'll conclude this part of the service. The walk to Emmaus reminds us that God is at work even when we can't see. God is at work even when we can't see. John 20 verse 29 tells us, Blessed is he that has not seen and yet, what? Believes. Blessed is he that has not seen and yet believes. 
How many times during our heartache and confusion, when facing unknown challenges, uncertain futures, did I have to lean on God's word and lay everything at his feet? I know in your brokenness, I know when your emotions are getting the best of you, we have to obey Christ. We have to trust in him. We need to lean on him, seek his face, and put our hope and trust in him. The disciples' eyes were hidden initially so that they could not recognize the physical features of Jesus, verse 16 of Luke 24. But at that appointed time, verse 31, God revealed himself and their eyes were open and their lives were changed forever. Do you remember when you and I became believers in Christ, those that are Christ followers? When Jesus opened up our hearts and caused our hearts to recognize that we were sinners? And through that recognition where he, he convicted our hearts, we invited him to be Lord and Savior. Our lives were changed. And when Jesus comes back on the scene and shows them indeed that the miracle had occurred, the disciples' eyes were open and their lives were changed for eternity. Aren't you glad for those that have accepted Christ as Lord and Savior that God opened your eyes and allowed you to see the resurrection confirmed his word, his authority, and his lordship. The wages of sin is death, but Jesus became sin and died for us, and through him we have life, life everlasting. The challenges of this world can cloud our vision and leave us anxious and fearful. There are times you will have no answer but faith. God wants to open our eyes, reveal himself to us so that we might see. And that road to Emmaus all was not well. And as the stranger began to share more about himself and revealed himself through the breaking of bread, and as he showed himself to be Jesus, the disciples saw him for who he was, the risen Savior. Do we see Jesus as the risen Savior today? Final thought in conclusion. I want to ask you a question. How is your personal walk with Christ? Does your soul burn to communicate with Him? Or does it sputter from one obstacle and fear to the next? Believers today follow Christ not by sight, but rather through faith. 1 Corinthians 5, 7. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe, John 20, verse 29. Even when the disciples couldn't recognize Jesus, there was something inside them telling them, believe. As we look back over this walk to remember, we are being reminded, just believe. God is at work today. If we can't see it, we need to call upon him to open up our eyes and ask him to reveal himself in a mighty way. Will you pray with me? Father, as we think about the importance of this walk to remember, this walk to Emmaus, I thank you that as we are looking over how what a wonderful miracle it was to see you come in the flesh and reveal yourself to those disciples and then later reveal yourself to the other 11. Father, we just we praise your holy name that that indeed you are risen. And Lord, some of us, our eyes are cloudy today. We can't see clearly. The world has got us down. Obstacles are coming our way. It's causing us not to see clearly. And we're, we're not functioning. And we need to be encouraged by you. We need you to take the scales away and of, 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 of putting our focus on everything else and putting our focus singularly on you. So for believers in Christ, I pray in your holy name that we will again see clearly the risen Savior. And still others, Lord, those that are followers of the world, those that have yet not to, to invite you in to be Lord and Savior of their lives, I pray this morning that you're taking those scales away for the very first time. They're seeing their sinners. They're knowing, just like us, that we all fall short of the glory of God. But Lord, may they know that by your name and your name alone can they be saved. And by confessing with their own tongue and believing with their own heart, they too might be members of the family of God. 
Thank you for revealing that to those individuals today. And may they make that decision to invite you in to be Lord of their lives. Thank you for this walk to remember. Thank you for being glorified in your word. It's in your name we pray. Amen. That concludes this part of our service for today. I want to remind you, if you're making sure that you're not missing anything within the church body, we're trying to make sure you're not missing anything either. I know with this coronavirus, you're hearing things on TV and on the radio, and, and we're trying to monitor all that as well. Um, just keep, keep track through our website, keep track through our one-call phone tree, keep track through our emails, the, even the church sign that's on the side of the road. Make sure you're keeping up to date with all the things that we're doing. Uh, if there's anything we can do for you, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, our church office is open from 8.30 to 2.30. Make sure you make a contact there. And if you want to still be part of the Annie Armstrong uh, Easter offering, that is going to be continue to be taken up through the end of April. So drop that off by the church office along with your normal tithe and offering, if you're allowed or able to, to give rather. Um, and you can just drop that off or you can send it via snail mail at Oak Grove Baptist Church, 1022 Oak Grove Road, Kings Mountain, North Carolina, 28086. God bless you and until the next appointed time, we'll see you next time. May the Lord be with you.